welcome to Adventures in Solitaire. Today we'll be discussing Hostile Solo. So as always, what is Hostile Solo? And as always, I think it would be best to take a look at what Zozer Games and Paul Elliott, the author himself, has to say about it. Hostile, I have seen the dark universe yawning, where the black planets roll without aim, where they roll in their horror unheeded, without knowledge, or luster, or name. H.P. Lovecraft. Hostile Solo is a standalone solo role-playing game set in a grim and gritty future, inspired by movies like Outland, Alien, Dark Star, Pitch Black, Event Horizon, and The Thing. It allows a single player to create and play the roles of a group of blue-collar workers out in deep space, overcoming difficult challenges and facing unknown terrors. So, with that said, and before we get too much further into the review here, I do need to make a couple of things clear. Paul was gracious enough to send me a review copy for this review. And to be honest, it won't just be for review, it will be joining my shelf next to my desk. This review and overview has been a long time coming for me. I have been aware of this work for some time now and have had to hold my excitement in silence. I had one of the greatest honors some months ago when Paul Elliott allowed me to playtest, preview, and lend some of my thoughts to the game system as it was entering its final stages of completion. He was exceptionally kind and patient with my thoughts and he took recommendations by myself and others into account as he worked on this amazing solo system for Hostel. He also took a revised space combat system I'd worked on for the book and included those modifications in the final copy. It was an experience I will never forget and I will always be grateful for. He really is a great author and it was more than a pleasure to work with him. I wanted to get that out there as I try to be open and upfront with all of my reviews and overviews. This will be both. As mentioned by the author, this is a solo system. This book was written from the ground up for solo play. This is mentioned explicitly in the first page of the game material. It is also meant to be a standalone RPG, meaning that though there is plenty of source material and supplements in the hostile universe of books, it is meant to be played on its own without the need of that material. Although I would argue that the additional material only goes to enhance what is already a very good system. While most solo systems focus on the player, Hostile extends that focus to the entire crew as well. While your character will be yours, you will not always be in the spotlight. The Hostile solo system does its best to create thematic cinema-like experiences, and much like our favorite movies uh, in cinema, and more info on characters that are integral to the main character and plot. It is possible to play a game of Hostile without focusing on a group or a crew, but it really shines when the crew or party are taken into account. Also, this is part of the Hostile universe of books, so it will, of course, be based on that setting. So if you are new to Hostile, Hostile takes its roots from movies like the Alien series, Outland, Blade Runner, The Thing, The Abyss, Total Recall, Event Horizon, and many others, as you can see from the list shown here. I have found that as I have read through Hostel Solo and the other books in the Hostel universe, if I keep this in mind, it always seems to be on point with these themes. And I could not be more happier as somehow Paul has managed to capture all of my favorite dark, gritty sci-fi films and elements in this book in the series. And to help with that setting, although I have covered this in the Hostel setting review, I thought it might be good to read over the book's explanation of the setting here. The future of 2225 is not as optimistic and rosy as many sci-fi writers had us to believe. Science exploration is difficult, hard, and dangerous, and the thriving interstellar society made up of hundreds of populated planets never materialized. Instead, space is the preserve of the big corporations that focus on extracting minerals, oil, and other raw materials from the extrasolar planets and moons to be shipped back to Earth in order to support the vast populations there. Space is not a place for tourists or fortune hunters. It is a hostile and brutal frontier where blue-collar men and women work hard and rely on nobody but themselves, risk death every day and face the unknown. And out here, the unknown is real. It is horrific. 
There are rumors of the disturbing side effects of hyperspace, of ancient horrors entombed on icy moons, and of monsters, killer aliens, perfectly evolved to survive the hostile wastes of space at any cost. People will live and work on settled off-world colonies, of course, but they work hard and they work for the big corporate concerns. There are settlements full of miners and their families. There are drilling rigs, refineries, science outposts, logging camps, vast open cast mines, production and maintenance facilities. Think of it as almost an Alaska in space with the crews of the star freighters playing the role of the ice road truckers. None of these habitable worlds is a paradise and most aren't even remotely Earth-like. There is always a kink that makes life tough, whether it's in the biosphere, the seasons, the radiation, the atmosphere, or one of a score of other deadly effects. Like the recruiter told you, it's a hostile universe. So when you first open the book, you'll be greeted with game terminology and the setting that we just covered. Hostel Solo will then discuss the various nations and organizations and conglomerates or corporations in the Hostel setting. As a welcome addition, it also shows the entire known Hostel universe with a set of seven maps, one large color map for the entire known local universe, and six more for the seven zones that make up the main map here. It will also explain the iconography on the maps as well, and this will come in very handy as it is so very important to know what types of worlds and resources are available from one star system to the next. The last thing that you want to do is to have you and your crew explaining to your corporate patron why you're having to wait a couple of weeks to be refueled deep within the frontier. So knowing what systems have gas giants available can be crucial, as those can be used to fuel your ship. Before the book goes into detail in the rule system, it has a really cool magazine-like introduction to the goings-on and history of the Hostel universe. The author has always done a great job with adding thematic imagery and flavor to his books, and it definitely shows here as well. Um, anything that can make me feel as though I'm reading the books as if it came right from the universe, that is the universe that I'm reading about, that, that's going to be a win for me. So moving on. Hostel Solo does not assume that you are a solo expert. It takes the time to make sure that you understand quite a few incredibly important solo concepts, and I really appreciate that. And although I was familiar with almost all of it, if not all, of the concepts included in the book, it really helped me wrap my head around what Hostel Solo was aiming for in regards to how it handles solo role-playing in its setting. So the first few pages are spent talking about the various concepts that you, the player, will be covering in the book. Hostel has it at least as far as I've seen, a very unique approach uh, to campaign and crew or party selection. Um, most of the time when I think about a solo RPG setting, it's pretty open to start without too much framework around my team or character. Um, while this is true to an extent with Hostel Solo, it will have you choosing a campaign setting. I know that initially Paul was going to run with a couple of campaigns, and I was so very pleasantly surprised to see that he went to a lot of work to add in a total of six campaigns to choose from. Hostel Solo has the following campaign settings. Shipping, Exploring, Colony Survival, Marine Squad, Asteroid Mining, and Troubleshooting. The campaigns help provide a framework for different gameplay mechanics that are specific to the aftermission crew and or party types. While the crew types can potentially make use of all of the gameplay mechanics in Hostel Solo, a colony work crew will not likely need to know about some of the mechanics that a starship crew would be making use of uh, on a very consistent basis. So it's best not to think of these as purely strict campaigns, but rather guidelines to help you structure the campaign around the work, encounters, and gameplay mechanics that you'll be making use of most of the time. Each crew page will give you an overview of what your crew will be doing for a living along with suggested career types for the crews. It might be important to note a few things here. I think that when we're imagining our role-playing sessions, we think of grand adventures. As solo role players, many of us think of what we as individuals will be doing. In the case of a grand space epic, we might imagine flying around in a ship and tracking down bounties or doing smuggling runs, etc. So we can sometimes be very self-centric here, but it is important to remember the setting that we are playing when playing Hostel set, uh, Solo. If we think back on the first Alien movie, to which the setting draws a lot of inspiration from, not just Alien, but others of that ilk as well, 
The ships are not manned by a pilot. These ships require entire crews to operate. It is possible to run these ships for a short time with a limited crew, but lack of skills running the gambit across multiple systems, along with all of the required man hours for consistent operation, will absolutely take its toll on the ship and by natural course, the crew itself. Ships are very expensive here. I know that many of us are used to saving money to buy a cargo ship or something similar in other, in other game systems, but going back to Alien, that commercial towing ship, a towing ship, mind you, is worth $4.7 million in adjusted credits. To put that into perspective, the best paying career in the hostile universe is a corporate executive. They're paid a total of $10,000 a month with some minor bonuses, while a ship's technician is paid around $3,000 a month with, again, some minor monthly bonuses. It would take many lifetimes at those pay rates to afford even some of the smallest business-worthy ships here. So most citizens, including corporate execs, if you consider them in the citizen class, still have to rely on their corporate patrons for transportation and means for income. Now, that is not to say that there are not illegitimate ways to get ships or that you could not get a much smaller ship somehow and make your own way in the world, but you would definitely be doing some backroom deals here as most of the work is issued to haulers, miners, and the like. And those are spoken for through trade guilds and their corporate partners. It's like trying to sell a product in a small town that is available at a discounted rate just across the street at a major, major retail chain. The market is not in your favor here. All that is left in this universe for those wishing to be self-made entrepreneurs are the table scraps of the conglomerates. It's not to say that it cannot be done, but it's going to take some adventure and creativity to pull it off in the dog-eat-dog -dog setting. I say all of this because the available campaign types will get you and your crew, temporary or otherwise, ready to start making their way in this corporate and government controlled universe. The campaign types will also set you up on your first mission for your crew, but we'll cover that later as after you have chosen your campaign and crew type, you will move on to character creation for you and your crew. So let's follow the book's direction here and talk about character creation in Hostel Solo. As the game points out here, there are nine quick steps to character creation. You will choose your career, and there are a total of 14 career types in Hostel, and they are the following. Android, Corporate Agent, Corporate Executive, Colonist, Marine, Marshal, Physician, Ranger, Rogue, Roughneck, Scientist, Spacer, Survey Scout, and Technician. Each of the career options will have a favorite attribute type, as shown here. They'll also have specific skills that are geared towards that career. You will get a total of seven points to divvy up between the six available skills shown here. You will have to use one of those points on the auto skill in the first column. This is seen as a required skill for that career type. Auto mining, by the way, meaning that you choose it automatically. No skill can have more than two points assigned to it during character creation. So if you are inclined to do so, you can make sure that you had at least one skill point in each of these skills or you could have three skills at level two. After this, you'll roll on one of two tables, your choice, to receive a single point and on a random skill from that table. We will go into more detail on skills shortly. After your skills have been chosen, you'll move on to characteristics. These are your character's attributes. You will need to keep in mind that while assigning and rolling these values, your career's preferred characteristic will need to be at least seven or more. To get this process started, you roll two dice six a total of seven times. I think it's also worth mentioning that this is a D6 system. You're not going to need anything aside from a couple of two six-sided dice. You can get away with one, but definitely recommend uh, two there. So you'll get this process again by rolling two D6 seven times. You'll then take the lowest two D6 result and toss it, keeping your remaining six values uh, from the other six rolls. From there, you'll manually choose where to assign these values. You'll then move on to choosing a name for your character, along with your age, position, or rank, and your appearance. With that, we're almost done. Our character will need to undergo a corporate psych eval before being sent on their way. To do this, you can manually select or roll on the psych eval table shown here. This will not only help flesh out your character and their behaviors, but it'll also help establish the same for the crew. Uh, this can have very large impacts on how your crew handles certain situations or communications and relations with other members. 
The last and final step is equipment or hardware, and of course, wages. This is likely to be one of the easiest steps as there's not much that you really need to do here. Wages and hardware or equipment are loosely defined here. Hostel assumes that your basic needs are taken care of by the company directly. Think of uh, food and bunking on ship or colony, or that your character uh, makes enough to make ends meet. It does have a ranking list of wages and uh, what amenities or lack of amenities your character can expect if you're in need of further detail. There is also an equipment list that breaks down uh, a reasonable amount of equipment options. The author does note that um, should you desire more equipment or maybe even just want to delve into the lore through equipment, that you can grab a free copy of the Hostel Toolkit through Zozer Games website. In fact, it explicitly states, go and get it. I will talk briefly about some of the other Hostel supplements that can help to enhance Hostel Solo later on in the overview. I would say that there is enough here, though, in the Solo Core book uh, to get by pretty easily, however. After your character process has been completed, Hostel Solo will walk you through the various resolution mechanics that it offers for the game system and for solo play. Some of these would also qualify as using Oracle mechanics. The core resolution mechanic for Hostel Solo is called Task Resolution. If you are already familiar with the Hostel Core rules, Hostel Solo takes a bit of a departure from its DM guided core book and sticks to pure task resolution for almost all roles. This includes roles that are solely character attribute roles. This really helps simplify the system for solo role playing and it really seems to fit and work well here. Task resolution is a rather simple process. By default, the difficulty of any task that you're trying to make is eight or above, listed as eight plus in the book. To attempt a task, you'll simply roll two six-sided dice and see if you roll at or above an eight. If you do, you're successful. If you do not succeed in a roll, then you have failed to one degree or another. It can work this way uh, for successes as well in regards to degrees of success. The task resolution system also incorporates modifiers to your roll here. This can of course be negatives or positives as you can see here. So you will want to make sure that you use these and take in all of the potential modifiers for better or worse. You will then roll as before and see how you fared. So we talked about degrees of success or failure a few moments ago. So what does that look like? Hustle Solo has a handy table <clears throat> to help with this process. This should look and sound familiar if you have been doing solo role playing for a reasonable amount of time. The table describes roles that exceed the eight or above default by six or more. And it also goes the opposite direction with failed roles of six or lower. As I mentioned before, the author really makes sure that we understand how this can be used for our solo role playing setting. In fact, all the materials that we have gone over so far have ample descriptions on how to use the book's processes in the solo setting, and it will continue to do so throughout. Your character and your individual crew members will not always be rolling alone. When there is an extended list or task of roles to be made, then it may be necessary or better to move on to the next type of resolution role called scene resolution. Scene resolution can be thought of as a way to resolve an extended situation that would likely involve multiple roles. It is also used to help strip time and potentially unnecessary solo role playing die rolls. When you are presented with a situation where you would need to do some planning or thinking about how you are going to take steps to resolve a situation, this is another good indicator for using scene resolution. For example, Let's say that you know that you need to get out of a section of a ship that is locked down and about to go critical. You know that your best and really only viable avenue is through the airlock so that you can spacewalk to another safer area of the ship. The only problem, there are multiple doors, hallways, and vent shafts that will need to be passed through to make this work. To make matters worse, you know that you will need multiple skill sets and it is not just you that needs to make it through. It is you and your two crewmates, including the ship's engineer, Andy, who looks like he's already about to have a mental break and lose it. So you figure the various tasks and skills that you would likely need and where you'd want you and your team members to end up. Now, now it's time for scene resolution. The process is pretty straightforward, as you can see here. Choose the difficulty rating as either shaky, solid, or foolproof. This will set the role that you're trying to meet or beat. You will then decide if it's a safe plan 
or a dangerous plan. In the case of the situation we just described regarding escape from the failing ship compartment, I would say it is shaky and dangerous. With shaky, our typical 8 or above roll would instead, instead be a 10 or above. The last step would be to add modifiers and make the roll. You can add up to 3 plus 1 modifiers to your roll for each character that would be using a task specific skill. You can add another plus 1 for a piece of gear or something situational that would greatly aid the process of completing the task. After that, you would want to apply negative modifiers to the die roll. There's really only one listed, which would be a character unsuited for the mission. So with our escape situation, I would say that we have a plus two for our two, our two characters with matching skills and a minus one uh, for the crew member who is about to have a mental break. So we would make our roll with a, uh, a plus one and add that to our result. After determining the success or failure of the mission, it's time to take a pause and roll to see if there were consequences regarding your success. When we are throwing our checks for saving throws or difficulty during a normal solo role playing session, things almost always go wrong somehow. Because of this, Hustle asks you to roll to see if there were any unknown consequences to our actions, successful or not. So you roll two die six and compare that to the initial difficulty rating of the plan. In our case, it was a 10. So it is likely that we've had some mess ups or issues in our situation, which would make sense given all of the things that had to go right uh, to come out without a scratch. If the consequences did happen, you would roll on the consequences table to determine the theme of the failure or failures and then implement them with our characters and our narrative. These can also be adjusted based on the danger level as well. Hustle also has seven inspirational rolls that you can make spread across two tables. These are the action and theme tables that I know come in oh so handy for solo sessions when we're trying to find directions of topics, etc. It also has personality, ship, installation, surface, and personnel tables as well. This was a very welcome addition and certainly can help with situations where we need to have a little bit of inspiration to help us along with the consequences of failed scenes, for example. Um, there are plenty of other tables in the book that can also help with this, but we'll cover those tables later. But the inspiration tables will likely be one of the most referred to tables in the book. The scene resolution process can also encompass much longer and detailed scenarios as, scenarios as well. Um, it is up to you to decide when and how often to use this system to prevent potentially unnecessary downtime. In addition to scene resolution, Hustle also presents a few other alternative oracles for puzzling our way out of questions as um, has a dip, the typical D6 scalable uh, yes, no. Um, it also um, has an ask the D6 tables for situations uh, and persons. And as the author mentions in the last part of this section, just decide. There will be many times where we will likely run into combat situations, whether that be with rogue android or crew members or alien menaces, who knows, or maybe perhaps a local law enforcement apparatus. Aside from scene resolution uh, to handle these situations, Hostel gives us a couple of other options as well. The first option provided by Hostel Solo directly is the combat system. Combat covers everything from initiative uh, to random setup of initiative along with combat ranges, hand-to-hand -hand combat, firearms, opposition types, morale, experience levels of the opposition, offensive and defensive stances, actions or moves that are available to enemy or players, wounds and healing, explosives, vehicles and robots in combat, along with alien menaces, of course. This sounds like a lot to take in and set up, but Hosso Solo makes this process pretty straightforward. Once you know who or what you're fighting, most of this is just going to be the initial setup. What is the range, if you don't know that off the bat? Who has initiative and what are they or you doing this round? Um, from there, you'll be making attack and morale rolls. So most turns will be spent rolling to hit and determining any enemy actions or crew actions, along with damage if it's dealt. You can, of course, feel free to omit any of these, but I'm so very glad that these systems were included for flexibility of need or desire. I personally bounce between this system and scene resolution as needed to resolve these types of encounters. This system can be used for small one-on-one -on -one encounters or entire squad or crew on crew-based combat if desired. 
On the note of flexibility, the author states that you can use the hostile core rule book rules for combat. They are the full pen and paper old school combat rules that we're familiar with. Personally, I don't know that I would want to refer to those that often due to the complexity of the system, that being the core rules, but it is certainly always an option if you feel like you really need that extra bit of detail. And you could not have a game set in space without the possibility of space combat. Here you have a step-by-step -step quick and thematic space combat option. This is a bit quicker and simpler uh, than the hands-on combat from the previous section, but it covers enemy actions and player actions along with damaged ship equipment and its effects rather concisely. Ship-to-ship -ship combat can be extremely dangerous. If your ship is disabled, you have nowhere to go but out the airlock or an escape vessel. It is a very dangerous endeavor indeed. Like the standard combat rules, space combat rules from the Hostile Core book can be used for much more granular detail here. It may also be worth noting that the Hostile Core book has a simple combat option for solo roleplay that is a bit lighter than the rules included here. The combat rules in Hostile Solo are a middle ground for complexity and thematic space combat. Moving forward, Hostile Solo has an entire chapter dedicated to building plot and establishing the world that your character will be surviving within over time. It covers the passage of time as a nebulous entity and ask us to envision it as we do scenes in a movie, which I think if you have been solo role-playing for some time, then you are likely already used to, uh, to doing this. But the author makes sure to go into this in detail for the novice solo role-player, which is much appreciated. It then moves on to talk about random encounters and events and how they are drawn out through the six campaign structures provided in the book. It covers the initial first mission setup and how those are handled in coordination with inspiration tables and context clues to help build plot. But the largest portion of this chapter is dedicated to non-player characters, crew, and their relationships and interactions. It covers changing relationships using relationship tables and character reaction tables. I felt that this really helps frame relationships that are both momentary and ongoing. It also brings into play the concept of spotlighting. If you are not familiar with this, it is a method by which you choose, or randomly choose, a topic or person to focus on. In this case, it suggests using this method from time to time when you would otherwise have downtime in the narrative or when a character had not received enough time in said spotlight. When we think of movies or novels, we often see much of the main character but we'll always see story and character building of other characters because the book or movie will take the time to shift the character into frame. The story is almost always about more than just a hero on the cover. The hero on their own often has little meaning without others to stand in contrast and to give meaning and narrative to the hero's actions. This is a really good mechanic for solo role playing and one that I use myself in other systems. Hostile Solo has a pressure mechanic in the way of the looming crisis. This is, of course, an at-will feature, but it tracks what it calls drama points that will eventually lead to a completely random and unmodifiable crisis. This can be a hostile life form, crazed crew member or NPC, a rival group arriving on the scene, a computer malfunction, think of movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, Virus, or maybe Saturn 3. Or it could be a reality-bending horror or finally a natural or technical catastrophe. Closing out of this section of the book that deals with gameplay, Hasso Solo talks about how to record a mission log to keep track of the converging narratives for a cohesive story. The next few sections of the book cover common procedures and needed info for ships and space travel. It starts off by covering space flight procedures. This includes import processes such as loading and unloading procedures, refueling and gas giant refueling, flight mechanics and maneuvers, sensors, time and distance, hyperspace travel, hypersleep, the landing process, airlocks, distress signals, communications, and docking. There is more than enough detail here, I would think, for almost anyone. Of course, one could always ask for more, but when I think about other sci-fi space titles, I cannot think of many, aside from Hossel's own inspirations, that dig this deep in regards to space travel mechanics. You, of course, do not always have to bother yourself with all of these options, but they are there if and when they are needed. 
It also has a good selection of ships to work with so that you are not left handcrafting these on the fly. Alongside this are a list of various ship name tables based on the class of ship that's being named. There is a randomized orbital station interior system in place. This is a pretty quick process that provides what is needed to start working your way through an unknown station or derelict or otherwise. It has a decent clip of tables to help with this as well. Hostel Solo makes sure that you also get the same attention for ships and colony outposts as well. It talks about how to make best use of all of these generated schematics along with different states of activities such as active versus cold and dark and degrees of those states as well. This is the first time in the Hostel series of books that I have seen all of these in one place. I was very happy to see this here. So this gets us to just about under halfway through the book. And it really only gets better from here, as the rest of the book is dedicated to each of the six campaign types. Here you will find tables that are commonly used by each campaign. These tables can be shared, and almost certainly will be, between campaign types. So let's go ahead and jump into the various campaigns and what they have to offer here. All campaigns contain a checklist that is a sequence of events that each campaign can be played in. These are particularly important on your first few playthroughs, but you will likely be using these to help keep yourself centered on your campaigns long into the future. I found these to be invaluable and it would be a huge loss not to have these. Having said that, these are guides and not strict rules that must be followed. I happen to enjoy all of the steps personally, um, and there is also nothing that says that you cannot add your own to this list as well, such as maybe uh, spotlight checks or looming crisis checks if you want to veer uh, from the crisis system a bit. Most of the campaigns are pretty similar in structure as to how it handles tables, missions, and events, but because each campaign has its own tables, again, these are likely to be used across all of the campaigns as well, so we're going to spend some time going quickly through them. The last point that I want to make as we do so is that while my language may suggest that there is some rigidity to structural campaign adherence, Hustle Solo is like many of the solo experiences we can have. In other words, what was supposed to happen, more often than not, is not what happens. Best laid plans and all of that. A shipping expedition could end up becoming a multi-sector spanning conspiracy reaching to the upper echelons of the corporate ladder. So with that out of the way, let's get started. For the first campaign, shipping. The shipping campaign is a sort of jack-of-all-trades campaign. You will potentially be flying cargo runs, charters, salvage ops, and other various types of missions. Oftentimes, shipping crews will be required to tend to the needs of distant or fledgling colony or mining bases. So don't let the words shipping crew dissuade you. The life of a shipping crew can be more than even the most experienced crew bargained for. But that's why they pay you the big bucks, right? So to begin with, we are greeted with the initial mission table to get you started on your first mission or between narrative events when the crew needs something to do for their pay. There is a salvage table. Should the crew run into a salvageable ship or station or maybe a rogue lifeboat? Uh, or perhaps you might roll a salvage mission on the mission table itself. There is also a table for cargo and passenger content for those specific mission types. After mission setup, there's a list of tables for rolling up planets that you will be delivering to. I would recommend keeping a folder for these as you write them up, so you won't have to roll those up again. There are also encounter tables for space. Ships based on starport type, shipboard training that the captain may put the crew through to keep them on their feet, ship malfunctions, this is one you will definitely want to tab uh, out in the book, uh, ship reaction tables based on ship type, Colorful local general encounters, colony encounter tables for both small and large colonies individually as well as starport encounters. The last few tables here cover NPC generation and interaction topics like NPC attitude descriptions, patron encounters, patron missions, target of the patron mission, or really any mission if you wanted. And the last table here covers random people and locations for crew, colonists, colony, and ships or stations. The second campaign is the exploration campaign. The conglomerates in the hostile universe are always looking for the next gold mine and resources or scientific breakthroughs, and enough is never enough. So crews are hired for explorations into known and unknown destinations to find said resources. This is the primary role of the exploration crew. 
As with the first campaign, you will have the recommended career type, starting location, starting ship, and checklist. This will be the last time I cover this, however, as most of the campaigns make sure to cover these bases. Missions given by corporations in the exploration campaign can target inner system and outer system destinations. The campaign will cover the basics of surveying, which includes orbits and planets, stars, main world orbits, gas giants, asteroid belts, etc. It even walks through planet naming conventions in case you are lucky enough to find the mother load, a new planet or planetoid. With this comes the survey sheet. And I want to stop here for a moment because one of the things I love about what the author does here and with other books in the Hostel series is to include theme not only in the pictures and the adverts in the book, but in the sheets to record data about the various needs for your work, crew, and starships. It can really feel as if I'm making logs and notes as I might if I were there without all the extra detail and red tape that goes along with recording, of course. It was a really nice treat to see this. Moving on. It will then take you through the process of how to locate survey targets and has multiple tables based on the planetary body that you're surveying. You know, beyond one of the 300 surveyed worlds. Sorry, I have to get my alien references in here somewhere. So it covers intelligent life, um, not the truly intelligent life here. Uh, think like cows and other similar life. Um, it does reflect on finding remnants of intelligent life, however, as the book states, Think space jockeys and alien. There are tables for resource types that can be found on average per world type. It also gives detailed descriptions of a decent clip of resource types as well. Once you have a target, resources found there or not, the book will walk you through what the landing and exploration process looks like. This covers touchdown, the survey process, and problems that can occur while surveying. It talks about travel across the planets, and this includes cross-country encounters, vehicle types that you may, might be using. Um, and speaking of the intelligent life that we were talking about, there is a section covering animal encounters, and that includes creation of exomorphs. This comes with an alien inspiration table as well. The third campaign covers colony survival. Out of all of the campaigns available in the book, this campaign is the most flexible in regards to suggested career types. As you can imagine, there are many different careers that could find work on a standard colony. After the setup of the campaign, Hostel Solo talks a bit about established colonies and their general layout, so you can get a feel for what these should look like and while they're, why they're there. It talks about the various quarters of a colony, and by quarters I mean financial quarters. Colonies are mostly there for the profit, and nearly all colonies are ran by a corporate sponsor. It is rare to find a colony that is just there for the good of a few homesteaders. Each quarter, Hostel Solo will have you checking for colony stability. If the colony ends up failing a stability role, it can have a myriad of different issues that will need to be resolved before they really start affecting uh, the colony's bottom line. For this, the book has a few different tables that can or will need to be rolled on to check on the issue at hand. This can be anything from accidents, civil disturbances, engineering issues, audits, natural disasters. As you can see here, there are too many to mention here, but needless to say, there is enough to keep a colony crew busy, to be sure. It talks about how to fix the current issue at hand, and, and there is a special consequences table that uses the same methodology as the scene resolution that we discussed earlier in the review. The next part here that I really enjoyed, and I'm really glad he covered this, as it really has that corporate overwatch vibe um, is it's always about the bottom line. Ensure profit of the colony. All other considerations are secondary. This is the check for profit portion of the colony campaign. It covers the dreaded audit, corporate troubleshooters, a nice name for a corporate assassin, literal and otherwise, how to survive an audit, cooking the books, drugs, overworking colonists, shortcutting safety protocols, throwing someone else to the wolves, bribery, blackmail, and last but not least, taking your cut. It talks about the next year, which can be heavily influenced on the previous, of course. It also includes a corporate colony internal audit form that is just as thematic as the previous. Again, I am glad that he added these for theme. If Marines are more up your alley, then the fourth campaign, Marine Squad, is likely going to be for you. 
Aside from the standard campaign setup, Hostel Solo gives us a good overview of what the USMC looks like in the far future in its Marine Organization section of the campaign. It does a good job of giving a feel for what their structure looks like from a large scale down to a quick glimpse of squad level command. Following that, it covers typical Marine hardware. By hardware, we're talking armor, weapons, personal gear, and vehicles, including the dropship and APC. I'm hoping you're thinking what I was thinking here when I saw both of these. In the pipe, 5x5, five five, or ease down, you've blown the transaxle, ease down. Okay, so I was definitely happy to see these included. Moving on. It also covers some additional key equipment often available to a Marine unit. Uh, Marine missions um, receive a lot of attention here, and they are definitely more combat oriented. The Marine campaign has tables covering fast response missions, colonial deployment that covers assault missions, defend missions, and patrol missions. And it also has tables um, that govern how deployment or insertion will work, along with the uh, objective inspiration tables and how to resolve those objectives. The fifth campaign type covers mining crews. One might think that asteroid mining would be a pretty dull campaign, and certainly, although there are plenty of things that could creatively happen here, one need not look further than one of Hossel's own inspirations, Outland. Although I think that was a mining operation on the moon, so more of a mining war colony. But if you have not seen that movie and are a fan of these genres, I definitely recommend that you give that at least a try. It's not alien sci-fi, but it is dark and gritty and full of corporate shenanigans and not the funny kind either. Anyhow, back to mining crews. The Asteroid Mining Campaign comes with its own unique mining rig ship that I thought was a pretty cool concept and would love to fly around and maybe get into some trouble with. Most of the mining missions do not actually involve drilling for ore, uh, though they could if your science officer were so inclined. Um, I really appreciate that it didn't focus solely on pulling up pay dirt. Um, it does have a couple uh, more tables that cover um, the asteroid location itself, along with prospecting problems uh, that you and your crew uh, can get themselves into. It also goes into detail about what mining operations look like and the mining authority that governs most of the operations in the Hostel universe. Closing out the mining campaign, it will go into a bit more detail in regards to travel uh, to the system to prospect within the prospecting mission itself and some of the different types of problems that can arise with the missions. And last, of course, certainly not least, is the sixth campaign, uh, which is corporate troubleshooting. Um, of all the campaign types, this one can certainly be a bit on the shadier side of things. I think it's probably best to think of the corporate troubleshooter campaign as one of being a spy or an infiltrator. The number of roles and needs that you or if you're part of a crew will be fulfilling will be one of many. You will often be required to assume the identity of a worker for your own or another company. Infiltrators are there to make sure that operations are going smoothly or they're there to find out why they're not. Once a determination is made, it is your obligation to resolve the issue by any means necessary, if resolution is needed. Sometimes you'll be required to steal another rival company's secrets. So out of all of the campaigns available, this is certainly one that will likely result in some of the most action, aside from the Marine campaign, of course. Um, it is likely one that I would like to play with myself, though I'm not a fan of assassination or bullying of innocence and that may well be required. The corporate troubleshooting campaign is open-ended and does not have a checklist like the other campaigns do, as there are far too many things that can happen with this career. So if you are new to the system or to solo role-playing, this, this may best be something you might try after playing through some of the other various campaigns first. It does offer a large colonial mission table in addition to mission complications. Aside from the colonial table, it also offers the following tables. For Earth-based missions, it offers mission locations, goal targets, target style, mission items. It has tables for urban encounters such as um, investigation, NPC, scenario sites, events, descriptions, and corporate advertising. The corporate troubleshooting uh, campaign spends a good amount of time describing what the Earth of the future looks like for those that are considered to be more than human such as androids and clones. It covers local law and crime. It also talks a bit about in the environment and living conditions as well. It reminds me of a few movies in particular. 
And in particular, it reminds me of a line from a certain movie. Earth. Man. What a crap hole. Of course, it's not crap hole in that movie. But um, It also goes into detail about Earth-based missions. One of the largest sections of the campaign um, is the section on Nexus City. Nexus City um, it very much gives me a Neuromancer vibe here. It talks about how Nexus City was formed along with the uh, individual districts. And there are a lot. Um, in addition, um, it covers the various factions of the city as well. The uh, last and final section of the book will be walking you through a part of a playthrough or example campaign. This is not a guided campaign, meaning that you will not be playing along, but rather reading uh, examples of play. Though I have had enough experience with solo systems that I don't feel the need to have an example playthrough, I do appreciate the addition as it allows me to look through the author's eyes to see how they themselves envision their sessions and what a session should, or perhaps better said, could uh, be played like. And I am sure that it would certainly be appreciated to the uh, new solo role player. So with that, I think now would be a good time to go over closing thoughts. I had just finished reviewing the Hostile Setting book, along with another Zozer game, No Day to Die, when Paul, who is the author of the Hostile series in Universe, reached out to me and asked if I would take a look at a manuscript that he had been working on for some time. And that manuscript was, of course, um, Hostile Solo. I couldn't turn that down. And you'll see why soon. Quite some time ago, Paul's work had won me over with its gritty, down-to-earth, hard sci-fi science. It was directly inspired by cinemas of all-time greats like Alien, Outland, Abyss, and the like. The Hostile universe managed to nail that theme to a T for me. Finally, a universe that was fleshed out and one that I could feel at home in. So I purchased, over time, his books. I do not yet have all of them, but my library continues to grow. I worked with Paul for a couple of months, maybe more, and shared my thoughts. I had been wanting a soloable option for Hostel, and I patiently waited to play it as Paul had envisioned, and now I finally had the chance. Given that I have worked directly with the author, and that I have received the book at no charge, I had some concern about bias with my review, and as I thought about it, I realized that there was really no way to get out of any influence on my thoughts for the review, but I will, and do, speak my thoughts and feelings as they occur to me, as I always have. So please bear all that in mind as I give my thoughts here. As I walked through the final copy of Hostel Solo, I was greeted with content I had not seen before. About half the book, in fact, because that's about how far or my last touch was with, with helping Paul. But the whole of the theme and direction was on pace, not for what I'd already read uh, for Hostel Solo uh, up to that point, but for the Hostel series as a whole. For me, this bodes well, as I'm already a fan of the Hostel series. The quality of the book is what I have come to expect for Sozer games. Um, the book itself sports a nice glossy finish. The interior pages feel glossy, uh, but they don't become hard to read um, in the presence of direct light. It just feels good, and it really, really looks good. As with all the Hostel books, the artwork is um, on point and on theme. It has corporate advertising and a dark atmosphere. Um, it is easy to read and look at, and it just stays on that theme um, throughout. Um, the rules uh, were changed up a bit from the last time that I looked at the manuscript, and they've come a long way. The Hostel Core system had deep rules for combat, both on the ground and in space. My concern was the complexity that, we'd be re that would be presented in the system. Um, Paul took those rules and did what he does through most of the book, he gave me options. If I want quick and simple with one or two die rolls, I have that. If I want something a bit more complex that sits somewhere in the middle, I can do that too. And finally, there are always the core rules if I really need the extra detail. I rarely do need that amount of detail, however. And as stated, this scalability is present throughout. But as I look back and forth through the book for the review and was trying to nail down what I liked most it really boiled down to a few things. First and foremost is the setting, the theme, which again is nailed here. 
The next thing that I appreciated were the structured campaigns that really helped to get the player into the headspace of what it's like to live the life of a person in those various career, uh, careers or crews. There was not much guesswork here. Um, had those been absent, I would have been left wondering about a great many things. I then would have wanted exactly what he gave here. That is, if I managed to muster up the wherewithal to write it up. But I don't have to write that up because it's here. Now, as I get used to the life of, say, a colonial marshal overseeing a colony, I won't likely need the structure of that specific, as I know what that life is like. I know what those quarterly meetings look like and the dread that comes at the end of a fiscal year, the review. He spent half the book making sure that we knew what a day, a month, or a year looks like in many lives and careers in the hostile universe. As I looked at and read through these campaigns, I found my last major appreciation here. It was the tables. I recently praised another game's tables, that being Starforged, for adding such a huge and comprehensive list to my Oracle library, as sci-fi is such an underserviced theme for solo role-playing resources. They're out there for sure, but they pale in comparison to the offerings that we see in the fantasy genre. Also, Solo has an immense amount of oracles available. I find myself struggling to remember if all the tables in the Hostel universe are contained in this book alone. It honestly would not surprise me if they were all here. There are just that many. Outside of the campaigns, he has a few tables, but most of them will be found in the individual campaigns themselves. Some of the campaigns may borrow from others, but they can all be used no matter what you're setting in the Hostel universe. This is also a book that, if you love science fiction as I do, and you are wanting tables and oracles for solo role-playing, then this is likely worth the purchase for those alone, especially in PDF format. Here I would also recommend that you get both the physical copy if you're interested in, in, in playing and not just for the tables, and the digital copy, as you'll likely want to print those tables out for Hostel or any other solo uh, space RPG that you might want to play here. I found myself surprised as there were tables that I didn't even think to ask for. And that's always a breath of fresh air. As far as missing content or things that I would want to see that are not here, those, for the most part, seem to be remedied by the already existing Hostel universe of books. Hostel Solo is definitely playable on its own without the need to purchase any of the additional material. But when I get into a system or a game, I tend to want to have it all. I want to be immersed in that system. I want as much of it as I can get there. And I'm going to go ahead and make a statement here that I didn't think that I'd be making again. Back in the early to mid 90s, I had a game universe that I got completely lost in. I could not get enough. If you've seen pictures of my bookshelf, then you may have already noticed that universe. It was Battletech. It was so rich and I could not get enough of all of the uh, source books or material that also included the novels. But I never thought that I would have or find a game system that offered me my science fiction setting of preference either. Currently, I have the Hostel setting, Hostel Core Rules, Far Horizon, Pioneer Station, the Marine Corps Handbook, and Explorers. And I did have a pristine copy of Alien Breeds, because um, I, you know, I like the alien theme, um, until I had an unfortunate laundry accident that claimed it. Um, but... I plan on getting a hold of as much as I can and sharing that here as I can and without, without of course, drowning everyone in my, my passion there for the game system. While we're on the topic of content, I did reach out to Paul and inquire about upcoming content for Hostel. Um, he said that he is currently working on three different colony-specific books and he's also uh, mentioned uh, the other content is uh, down the, the pipe as well. Um, I know that he just released Tal Seti, um, which I will eventually get my hands on. Uh, again, I'll probably get my hands on, on everything there for the, for the theme or for the universe. Um, and content just seems to be uh, keep coming in there, and I'm perfectly, perfectly happy with that. He can just keep making those. Um, all of my books that I currently have um, were purchased before any interaction with Paul, um, that with, again, with exception of uh, Hostel Sola there. So my review here is absolutely one out of like passion and, and devotion to the series. But that passion and devotion is not there because of investment. But for me, it's rather a reflection of the work that the author has done to make this such a rich, lived in, and um, again, recognizable uh, universe.
I remember when I had first found the hostel books, I felt this odd feeling of something that had been made for me. You know, it's that, uh, that feeling that the world revolves around you kind of a feeling. How did he know? He didn't. He just happened to share similar passions, and I am grateful for it. Um, and to be honest, as I've worked on this review, it has done nothing but draw me further into the universe, and I keep being pulled into this desire to drive into the material and start making my way in hostile, and maybe a sign for just that. So uh, with that, as always, if you have watched this far or not, thank you so very much, and um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.